Concerning belonging uh, has to do with the basic issue of homelessness. These are people that are largely misunderstood. Um, they don't really belong to society in many different ways. You know, they have no home, they have no kind of essential being and place in society because of that. In Broward County, the last point in time count, which happens in January, there are approximately 2,900 homeless individuals. Now, some of them are sheltered, some of them are here in our program or that throughout the county. Some of them were what they would classify as couch surfing, going from a friend to a friend to a friend, but have been listed as part of the homeless count. Back in the late 80s, early 90s, there was a lot of problems with homelessness throughout the downtown area. There were some legal decisions that were made in the uh, state courts and then ultimately in the national courts that provided for safe zones for the homeless. We opened up in February 1st, 1999, a 57,000 square foot facility that houses 200 men, women, and families. I started working at the Museum of Art in Fort Lauderdale, and that's right next to the, the Broward County Main Library, and there were you know, over a thousand people uh, there who had been displaced, who were homeless, who uh, were looking for social services that they had a lot of um, at that site, at that point. This was a, it seemed like a really, really big issue, um, so I wanted to put some thought into addressing it, and I approached the museum about um, basically going after some grants that had to do with social services and art as activism, and um, wrote a grant for this project, and it got accepted. We initially went after a, a grant with Funding Arts Broward, which is an organization in Broward County that serves to promote and cultivate the arts. And that was um, through a grant that they received from the Knight Foundation. So both of them are our sponsors, um, as well as the Community Foundation of Broward, who has been very generous as well um, in, in supporting the project. And um, everyone in, involved, all of the grantors, are, are really behind it um, and really interested to see what kind of effect it can have on um, the issues of homelessness uh, in Broward as well as the arts and basically how the arts and social issues can merge together and then you know be exhibited uh, for everyone else to see. I selected uh, several artists who I thought definitely had a background in, in social activism as well as uh, artist activism, like their, their personal lives and their professional work both have to do with a lot of social issues. And they're also um, contemporary artists who work with concepts and themes um, maybe a lot more than uh, actual media, such as uh, digital media or painting, et cetera, et cetera. You know, they're very uh, cross-media, but all of their work has a very deep conceptual basis to it. My name is Natasha Lopez de Victoria, and I also go by Tasha, which is, which is what my sister called me when she was little, and we work together usually for the past over 10 years as TM sisters. And we make collaborative works, video DJing, a lot of animation, video games with our brothers sometimes, and then fashion pieces, performances, and, and two-dimensional collages and zines. So each work that I do is lately with my sister, and we've together collaborated on any sorts of op optical illusions. We like to mess with the audience where, where it's interactive, that when someone shows up, the piece will activate the most when there's a presence of a human being. I'm part of this project because it's, it was a new concept. I was approached by Luke Jenkins to figure out a workshop that would engage the homeless community in, in Broward. Specifically, he was thinking that it would be some sort of healing process. So since my background is in, my, both of my parents are psychologists, that I, I'm really comfortable working with ways of releasing and new experiments for, for psychological healing. It just sounds really exciting to approach a project that would be healing and also creative at the same time. My name is Antonio Wright and I make performance-based work for live audiences for video and photography. For me, performance art is different from theater in the sense that everything I do is unrehearsed, even though I practice and imagine it in the moment. 
it's open. I'm not sure what the outcome will be, and everything is real, and it's kind of like if it's going to be if it'll work, or it could be like an epic fail, and I'll never know until that exact moment. What inspires me to make these projects is empathy. I find that as a society, one of our biggest issues facing us is apathy. I think apathy is the worst emotion, just not to feel, and I experience it myself, and so I force myself to enter into a conversation with the world we're living in to cause myself to deeply feel in the hopes that it will cause the viewer to feel as well. Well, I've worked with um, like homeless, the homeless and groups of homeless and taught at homeless shelters before. I've grown up with a, a really amazing family and a really empowering mother, and I can't imagine being where I am now without the structure and the foundation that I had. I just feel like these are groups of people that are usually very easily forgotten. And as a society um, in this country, unless you have money, you don't have power. And so a lot of people are just kind of like left um, and marginalized. And it's really easy for people to lose everything you have. And I think that this is just a way to give back and to help and to show that I hope that my pieces um, that will be played at the museum that are created by um, the guests at the shelter will show that, you know, each person is dynamic and can be creative and capable of making beauty. And I hope that that causes an empathetic response to the museum goers. Uh, my name is Austina Woodgate. And uh, I guess that my art will be considered conceptual art. I do a lot of interventions both to objects and to spaces. My practice really has two big main directions. One in the streets to a more broader audience, to an audience that's actually encounter the, uh, encounter the art without even knowing maybe that is art. And then the other one, which is more ob objects uh, that exist in museums or in the art scene. Um, to be honest with you, it's more exciting to me, the one that's in the streets, just because I have a feeling that it's a um, more honest reaction that I get from people, just on that unexpected uh, feeling. With a shelter here in Miami called the Lotus Shelter, inspired by one of my pieces, um, which are animal skin rugs that are made out of stuffed animals, teddy bears that we take apart and we puzzle, and I puzzle them in into one big rug. <clears throat> I brought this to the shelter and the women actually wanted it to keep that one. So instead, I, I offer them to help them and to teach them to make one themselves. They thought they would never be able to complete that. I didn't know how to sew, so I shared my story with them and I said, look, I just had an idea and I didn't know how to sew. That's why sometimes I, <clears throat> that's why I feel more comfortable with the term conceptual artist because really I'm not attached to any technique. I just have ideas and then I somehow self-teach myself to do them. These ideas are not attached to any uh, technique or discipline at all. They could happen in any realm. It's part of the point of, of my work is to collaborate across disciplines in this way. Truly my hope is for interaction and collaboration. I am mostly more interested in the process than in the final result. And that's always how I move. I never know how things will look. And, and I, the exercise throughout the process is always to let go on the final result because if the process is working out, the final result will be okay. Basically, my, my hope is that the project will have um, a pretty direct influence on the clients, the homeless people at the shelter that are a part of it. And 
it could be anywhere from um, you know giving them a better understanding of where they are through the questions that the artists are asking in the workshops and the reflection periods that are going to be happening in the workshops as well. That's a really big part of the, the process for each artist is um, not only asking questions and asking them to get creative, but also to reflect on um, the type of ideas that they're dealing with um, as a group and then personally as well. Sound art is basically putting words into making a sound from those words. Well, at first I heard it was arts and crafts, so I thought we would be making stuff. So it was a surprise when it was basically sound art, but I liked the concept of it. This is something new that I never thought about, and uh, I liked, it was interesting. It was a very fun class to be a part of. Plus it's, you know, something that's very new to me. Well, something I've never done before, something different. I figured it'd be fun. And it's turned out to be fun. So I thought it was very interesting, it's something I had never done before. As a society, we kind of have a limited vocabulary when it comes to talking about sound. When it comes to talking about anything visual, we have a tremendous vocabulary and we can really describe things, you know, visually. But when we start talking about sound, we don't even know what words we want to use to express ourselves. So that was sort of a challenge of this course. Every day in class, we did the same exercise where I would ring a, a bell and then we would close our eyes um, for, it started as 30 seconds and we graduated up to a few minutes and we would just listen to the noises around us. And the first day we did it, people were laughing, they were banging on the table, they were shifting, they were coughing, you know. Um, and then the last time we did it, it was really silent. And then uh, we would talk about the sounds and we heard all these different ranges of sounds. And, I did ask the question, do you find you're listening to other sounds that you weren't noticing before? And almost every single person in the class said yes. We listened to sounds, closed our eyes, and listened to the room. And it's amazing how when you cut off your eyesight, your hearing or whatever else, it, it just jumps out at you. It makes you aware of a lot of things. It just brings out things that we neglect. We don't think about them. My goal was to make these sound portraits for each of my students. So it would be a list of sounds that would kind of embody who they were. So um, through a series of writing um, assignments and exercises, I got them just kind of talking about who they were and like why they're different, why they're special, and what makes them different from other people. Uh, we discussed um, where we lived at, where we worked at, our places we've been, people we talked to, our children, our family. I took some of the stuff that I've written and it was um, a dove, uh, an ocean, uh, a dog. And what we did was incorporate all our answers into sound art. We took those questions and I kind of, uh, I printed out maybe something like 500 different sounds and I gave them this list and then I had them go through and kind of take their answers and match them to sounds. So kind of going from more general to much more specifics. And we started out without any noise involved, just answering the questions. And then she gave us the paper to answer the questions with the paper that she had printed out with different categories that relate to our answers and the sounds that it would be like. So if you were feeling aggressive, you would say you felt like a lion, example, or peaceful like a dove. And then if you felt like you were on an up and down, as I did, I put roller coaster. Because it's funny how you have things that you like in your life, but you don't focus on them until you have to. So it was, I always knew that I enjoyed sea animals. And it was really funny how every time I was asked a question that came popping out at me, it was 
I, I just, you learn things about yourself like that, that you never even thought about. We were trying to really dial in on the specific sound for each, um, the specific version of each sound that they had chosen. And I described it to them as what we're trying to do is show how you're different, you know, how you're unique, how you're um, your own completely individual person. And the more specific we can choose these sounds, the more it will reflect the essence of who you are. Um, I said to them at one point in one of the classes, you know, what good art tries to do is come to the essence of what something is. So that's sort of our goal here too, is we're trying to come to the essence of who you are so that if somebody listens to these different 10 sounds in your portrait, they'll get this feeling of being with you in a way. Um, associating the way we are useful or the way we are utilized or the way we are just hanging around like a pretty picture or whatever. Um, with the objects themselves. So when I thought about it, I did some in-depth thinking about it that evening, I thought, that's really cool. That makes sense how, you know, sometimes we're like a windshield wiper, we're back and forth, back and forth, or whatever, you know, like the, the chirping of a bird, we're quiet and docile one day. My sound portrait consists mostly of sea animals, but I also see where other things like electricity would be my per, a part of my personality. Um, I consider myself complicated and I chose sounds that weren't unlike anybody else's in the room. When we started revising their sound portraits, people were very opin opinionated on the sounds that they wanted. Um, whereas the first day was way more general as in like, I like the sound of water. Um, by the last day, it was, I like the sound of a semi-fast river on a sunny summer day. You know, very, 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 very specific. I told her I like taking long showers. So she, you know, she made that into sound. And I like Scarface movies. So she put some quotes from there. Dolphin sounds, um, kids laughing, um, a plane, a airplane um, flying. Places we live, different sounds of animals, cars. It was funny how my choices were just so totally different from theirs. It, it was just cool. What we did on the second to the last class is I met with each student one-on-one -on -one and we went through their sound portraits um, pretty thoroughly. We went through each sound and if there was a sound that they felt like did not fit with their portrait, we deleted it. If there was another one that needed a little bit of fine tuning or maybe a more specific type of sound, we substituted it. We worked on the order. Um, which is kind of important. Some people wanted it to be very quiet, going into kind of a louder sound or starting with nature sounds and then moving into human sounds. Other people thought that kind of like a more peaceful sound and then a more aggressive sound, a more peaceful sound and more aggressive and that kind of matched their personality. So we just fine tuned them. And then our last day of class, we had a big party and we played everybody's sound portraits. Uh, and we had food and we listened to music and we just kind of celebrated this experience. She's very nice. I like her and I like the way how she researched because she was looking up, uh, someone mentioned ladybug and we were looking for, she was looking for a sound of a, that a ladybird makes and she talked about looking on the internet for over an hour. I, it's funny because I wouldn't have done that. I would. I wouldn't have done that. I, if I couldn't find it in the first five minutes, I would have given up. But she's really good at what she does. And she was so passionate in trying to help us form our sound portrait that she took over an hour on the internet to find. That's dedication. I like it. I had a lot of fun. So it's, like I said, it's a very new thing to me, so. And I can't wait for the exhibit to to come to life and be a part of it. I think it's been great. I, have, I came every day for a week and every day the same students were there. Um, they were always waiting for me. Um, they were always responsive. They answered every question. Nobody really kind of gave me any resistance. I think everybody seemed to have a really positive experience. Um, 
Found art is a very abstract medium, even for people in the art world to accept. And everybody there really kind of went for it, which I was pretty excited about. I'm very open, but personal me, very closed in. And the sound portrait, it, it reflects that. And I never really thought about that. So I am looking forward to exploring it more. It's good. And the exhibit, I'm sure, will be fun. Augustina and I just showed up and we set up our shop. We decided to do both of our projects side by side. We set out the supplies, started working ourselves, and naturally, you know, like, if I saw that, I'd be like, hey, what are you doing? And they're like, oh, you want to join me? I'm, we're doing this. We can make some work. It'll be in a museum show, which is amazing. Eso no lo había hecho antes. Hicimos una figura y, y lo pusimos ahí. In the collage. So I thought it would be kind of amazing to share this thing called a future board. The idea is that if you can put your thoughts into a picture where you can actually see it, that you may find, you know, five years from now, that the things that you put in the collage, you actually are realizing them in real life. I just explained that process for me, and I asked them what it meant to them, and they started making things. Everyone just dove in and started grabbing magazines. We just had an open format table out in the, in the center. We got the pictures from um, several magazines. I mean, we got pictures from boating, uh, gardening magazines, health magazines, men's, men's health magazines. La recortamos y la pegamos en una cartulina. People started just participating because it's fun to put these things together and to think about your future. And a lot of people came out saying that the experience was bright and they wanted to do more art and, and they enjoyed thinking about what was meaningful to them. Whatever your individual message was, the group message was something futuristic. So on the particular one that I helped out with, uh, we were focused on health. You know, how uh, the things that you have to do to keep your health uh, intact and then the places where you can go if your health is intact. Le puse mi corazón y le puse también mis hijos y también la playa. Le puse los vegetales para uno comer bien. And then we talked a lot about art and concepts and building layouts. Some people really took it seriously with with um, thinking of a great composition and came back for a few days straight. And other people came back and started helping other people decide to you know, think about more ideas like that and color theory. Aprendí que es bonito trabajar con personas. Es bonito. Oh, Natasha, she's very, she's very helpful. Very, um, and she works right alongside you and makes sure, she makes sure that you have everything that you need in order to put your, you know, collage together, whether it be glue or scissors or whether it be another idea, you know, of a picture that you could cut out to convey the thought that you want to convey. Ay, ella es fabulosa. Fabulosa es, es sensacional. A lot of people were appreciative of getting to just play because everyone has to think so hard about finding a place and all the stresses of paperwork. You get to doodle and dream and plan like the fun stuff of life. I'm someone who likes to do artistic things and I would definitely be doing something artistic in the future. Okay, so the goal of everything is so that each person has their own work of art and they get to take it after the museum exhibition and we're framing them all so that they can have that special piece to put up in their home, which is what the goal is. In this workshop together, we all wanted to have that ideal surrounding. It's a symbol of passing to the next step of life, and it shows that you can get through and accomplish any, anything that you want to do, and makes it very believable, visible, and physical. I'm looking forward to the artwork being presented at the museum. You know, I can't wait. It's, uh, it's like something 
that I did that's gonna reach out and sort of touch others, hopefully. I brought an old big hemispheres of the world map and I shared with them a process the same way that I do it in my studio. We sanded down the surface of the map. I opened up the map and I started it sanding alone. And within 30 minutes, we already had people approaching us, oh, what are you doing? And started it asking, what, what is this about? What are you doing? How long are you staying? So that was incredibly successful. Well, my first task was to sand all the inside of the, the globe that's on the, that's on the map, to sand that and make that as clear as possible. It was very fascinating to me because I have never seen that done before. And um, learning it, 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 I learned something from that, that you could use some paper and send off a picture from a paper, actually. And it was very chilly. People end up falling into roles and end up discovering, I'm better at this, I'm better at that. And that also, to me, is also another sort of metaphor of, right? This community that was putting hands on to create something all together. By sending it, it made me think of how, the, how, the, how, how would we begin the world as being as one. It was functioning like stations, you know, they would work on project with Tasha, project with me, come back and forth, started finding connections between our, our projects too, which were really nice. And we realized that the overall theme that we were somehow touching on was the idea of, of their immediate future. It was very gratifying, you know. I got a lot of, lot of, um, it's, it's like solitude. I, I was, I was, I was very intrigued about what was going on. It, it was, it was, it was very soothing to the, to, to, to the soul. It was easy to invite people to help because I needed the help. And when they saw what I was doing, and it's such a, such a recognizable action to send, instead of starting the conversation on what it meant, the conversation was starting on like. Do you want to sit down and help me? I, I won't be able to do this at all. Then the conversations of why are we doing this, or I don't want to erase my country or where I come from, or... We erase America, we erase England, we erase Canada, we erase Russia, we erase because you're a map of the world. <laughs> then the second stage of the project happened, which was more of a learning process for me arose from the questions they were asking me on what are we going to do with the white space now. And in my practice, I don't do anything with that white space. I let the viewer complete it. But in this case, they had the intention to complete it. So they took my instruction, but then they wanted to create their own, which also helped me reflect on how, how I was going to collaborate with them. Because here I brought exactly what I do in my studio, but then how to allow them to have their voice in, instead of this being solely my project, being a collaboration. So we took the sanding time to talk about what would we do. Would we work with the dust that we are extracting or would we actually fill in the blank? And if so, with what? We were sanding away the old picture of the world, that wasn't it. Which was very, very, um, it takes some doing, but we did it. And then from there, it was, um, there was a discussion of what we should do to um, make it interesting. Well, the flowers was actually my idea um, she was trying to figure out what, what can we use because we wanted to use certain nature things. So I decided to use, I said, how about flowers? And she said, that's a great idea. They had come up with this idea of completing the white space with, with natural stuff. Taking the paper as a natural base coming from the trees and then filling in 
all the blanks by using the same action that they have used to erase. Now they are rubbing all these different plants and flowers and by the rubbing, sort of like squeezing the juice and tainting it, sort of like using a natural watercolor. We used roses, we used, this, we used uh, beets, we used um, carrots, we used grass, we used uh, dirt, we used ashes, we used tobacco, and we came up with different, different kind of colors, a variety of different rainbow colors. We, we got blue, purple, orange, yellow, uh, beige, black. We got all different varieties of colors. So it was wonderful to see that, that progression and to see how, and to allow them to really incorporate their voice. At the beginning, they wanted it to complete it with words. Those words ended up being the title of the piece. Unity is strength when we were together in the white space. But then through more conversation and actually discussions between them, where they say, where they were telling to themselves that they don't really know if that's a proper sentence or we should call a poet to write. So they started to also understand their, their limitations and, the, and also what they were good at. So Augustina was a very great teacher. She, she, uh, she spoke about her country, where she's from, and that's how she broke the wall as far as we, you know, we, got, we got to get to know her. And um, she, she showed us how it's a technique as far as mixing colors and how, and how the sand, as far as in a circular motion, it comes out better that way. And she just, she, she elaborated on certain aspects of her life and, and how she became to where she's at today. To present the project as this process-oriented project instead of a final result and this is what you make, it was understood that it needed it to create a momentum and people could come and go, but there needed it to be, um, you know, a rhythm to it. And this was interesting because at the beginning I was only sending with one person and at the end I had committed sanders that were actually waiting and they had roles between them and one was sanding the borders and the other one. So I, I like that a lot. She, she taught me how to get out of my element as far as and just focus on what I'm doing at the moment. Don't worry about anything else. You can't make any mistakes. It's all about you and get into your work and you and just get in touch, get in tune with the earth. And she's a very great teacher. Instead of me deciding how I want to show the work that we've done together, we decided it all together, how I wanted it, how we all wanted it to show this. And the consensus was that we were gonna show the map, and right next to the map, we were gonna show the video. The map looks so colorful now that it's almost hard to believe that that was painted with flowers. So they thought that it was important to show the process of how they've done it in order for the people to understand what they did. I'm looking forward to seeing my, my work I have accomplished. A lot of things in my life I haven't accomplished, but I feel deep down in myself that I finally ac accomplished something with the help of Augustina. She really showed me that there's nothing impossible that we can't do. Just put our minds to it and you can do anything that you want to do. I learned that you could, we could use a piece of paper the map of the world and change the color, change the whole picture to make different, different things. That would be very knowledgeable and edified to people. And young people that is coming up would learn from it to make the world a better place to live in.